she will be speaking about the bit of controversy and the main trees. Uh, so, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to speak here today. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, so, part of what I'm going to be talking about is based on uh, a work that I done in collaboration with uh, Bertrand Dupontier and, and Scott Sheffield. Okay, so this talk is going to have uh, four parts to it. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to give you an overview of what are called uh, random planar maps. And then in the second part, I'm going to describe to you a construction that you can build by gluing together a pair of what are called continual random trees. And I'll explain how this construction is related to understanding the scaling of the problem for these uh, random planar maps. Uh, in the next part, I'm going to give you a brief overview of Leoville quantum gravity. This is a continuum theory of, of random surfaces, and I'll also explain how Leoville quantum gravity is supposed to be connected to the scaling of the problems for uh, random planar maps. And then finally, in the, the last part of this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the results uh, that we've proved um, in this direction. So what is a planar map? Well, a planar map is just a finite graph uh, together with an embedding in the plane so that no two edges uh, pass. And the faces of a planar map are just the connected components of the complement of its edges. And a map is called a quadrangulation if it has the property that each face has exactly uh, four adjacent edges. And if you look here over at this picture that I've drawn on the left-hand side, then you'll see that this actually is an example of a quadrangulation, because each one of these faces really does have um, four adjacent edges. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that not only is it true that all of the bounded faces have four adjacent edges, but I've also arranged so that all of the so that the unbounded face has um, has four edges as well. And the reason for this is that I want to think of one of these quadrangulations as corresponding to a surface. And the way that this works is that for each one of these faces, like this one here, I associate with it just a usual Euclidean rectangle. And the way that I get my surface is that I just glue together these rectangles uh, according to whether or not they are adjacent in, um, in the quadrangulation. Unit size rectangles. That's right. They're just unit size uh, Euclidean rectangles. And in this talk, we're going to be interested in uh, different kinds of random quadrangulations. And I'm going to be referring to these objects as random planar maps. And sometimes I'll just abbreviate this with the three-letter acronym. Uh, and uh, these objects have a long history, uh, going back to work by Tuck in the 1960s on the four-color theorem. And since then, there's been a huge body of literature which has developed uh, in different areas of math. Uh, for example, what people like to do in uh, the combinatorics community is they like to prove different types of enumeration formulas for random planar maps. So for example, you can ask, you know, how many maps are there that have, say, a given number of faces, which are quadrilaterals, a given number of faces, which are triangles, uh, etc., and, and count. And in physics, what people like to do is they like to take different types of statistical physics models, like random walk, percolation, easy model, uniform spanning tree, etc., and then study them on uh, random planar maps. And I'm going to explain why uh, in just a little bit. And then finally, in probability, uh, you know, as probabilists, what we really like to be able to do is understand what it means to pick something uniformly at random. And if you pick you know, uniformly among all possible quadrangulations, let's say, with n faces, then you can think of this as kind of a natural, uh, discrete way to pick uh, a surface which is homeomorphic to the sphere. And when you take a limit, as the number of faces goes to infinity, this, uh, these discrete uh, spheres should converge to some sort of limiting sphere. And this limit should be kind of the canonical measure of uh, random surfaces in the continuum which are homeomorphic to the sphere, a sort of uh, Brownian, Brownian type surface. And I'll explain a little bit more about this um, in just, just a bit. OK, so here are two pictures of what a quadrangulation looks like. And the way that these quadrangulations were made is that one just took a piece of paper, cut it up into a bunch of smaller squares, and then glued together these squares to get a quadrangulation. Now, when you look at this for a moment, it might look like this is not really a quadrangulation, because you see these triangles right here. But really, all that this is, is this is just a square 
where, say, the top of it has been identified with, um, say, its left side. And when you fold a square over like that, you get uh, a triangle. So this is what quadrangulations look like. And again, the question that we want to understand is what, is the, what does a quadrangulation look like when it has n faces and n starts to become large? So, but, but in terms of the actual geometrical structure you're just describing, is it the abstract thing that you get by doing this identification and not the... You're curious if you tried to embed it in R3, but... Right, just the abstract object. So this one happens to embed nicely into R3, but I, when I talk about, for example, distances on the quadrangulation, I'm just going to mean with respect to, say, the graph distance, but not, not, the, not the distance which comes from the embedding of R3. Now, the first question that you can ask is, well, how many quadrangulations are there with n faces? And the answer, uh, this was first derived by Tuck uh, a long time ago, and more recently by Schaefer using a bijective approach, is given by uh, this number, this number here. And if you look at this closely, you see the Catalan number popping up. Uh, the reason that you see the Catalan number uh, appearing is that the bijections that one has for quadrangulations, in particular this one with the Schaefer, uh, relates quadrilaterals, the quadrangulations to the trees. And so the counting problem for quadrangulations is closely related to counting the number of trees that you have of a given size. Can you remind us what a, the Catalan numbers are? Yeah, so the Catalan numbers, I mean, they're just counting, um, what the Catalan numbers are counting are the number of paths that you have, which start from which say start from the uh, origin and come back to the origin and always stay uh, always stay positive. So these are these are discrete paths. They're integer value, and they look something like this. Okay? And you just want to count how many of them there are. And the reason that these things come up is that whenever you have uh, a discrete path like this, these uh, these paths are always in they're just in bijective correspondence with trees with n edges. And so if the path has, um, has two n steps, then this corresponds to a tree which has um, n edges. And the way that it works, let me make sure I do this correctly, is that you follow, you imagine that, say this is the root of the tree, and then you follow the boundary of the tree according to its contour. And then you just, as you follow the contour, you just keep track of how close you are, uh, how close you are to the root of the tree. And this is one of the elements in uh, this particular bijection to, to shape it for. Uh, Where is the Catalan number in the formula? Uh, so the Catalan number is just. Um, Just, uh, just this side. Okay. This is uh, another picture of what uh, a quadrangulation uh, looks like. In this case, this one actually has uh, 25,000 faces. And again, this is supposed to represent a surface which looks like a sphere. And this has been uh, subsequently embedded into space um, in some way. So this is actually computed using a spring embedding with, uh, with Mathematica. And one of the effects of this embedding is that it really distorts distances a lot. So this is really far from an isometric uh, embedding of this graph. But nevertheless, I think that this picture uh, really serves well to capture some of the features that a typical quadrangulation has. Uh, in particular, the types of surfaces that you get are not, you know, they're very unlikely to be a smooth manifold. They're going to be very rough and fractal objects with many spines, and they're going to have kind of a very complicated uh, interesting structure. And this particular simulation, this is due to uh, Jean-Francois Marker. He's in uh, Paris, and he did some important, some of the important work on random planar maps about uh, 10 years ago. OK. So now, um, what I want to do is I want to tell you about a particular problem which is motivated by statistical physics, in which random planar maps play uh, an important role in solving. <coughs> And so what I want you to imagine here is that you have uh, the grid, so Z2. And here, I've just drawn a part of this grid um, in, in this slide. And then what I want you to imagine is that we have three particles. So we have a red particle, a blue particle, and a green particle. And these particles are going to represent random walks. 
So just to remind you, what a random walk is, is that in each discrete time step, these particles will either go up, down, left, or right, um, with equal probability. And I also want these particles to move uh, independently of each other. So for example, maybe in the first step, the red particle goes down, the blue particle goes up, and the green particle goes to the right. And then maybe in the next step, the red particle goes to the left, the blue particle also went to the left, and the green particle went to the left. And as these particles move, what I'm going to do for you is keep track of the set of points that they've visited um, in this, this slide. Maybe the next step that happens, the next step that happens, etc. And if you think about it, because we're working in two dimensions, it's very likely that the set of points that these paths visit are going to intersect in many, many places. That's the sort of likely event. And conversely, the unlikely event is that these random walks are going to make it for a long distance without their trajectories ever intersecting. Okay. And so the question that I want to look at now is how unlikely is it that these random walks travel for n steps without their traces ever intersecting? So, so in other words, we want to look at this picture here. So we have our three random walks. They're starting pretty close to each other. And they run for a long time. And something like this happens. So rather than these paths crossing over each other, they just never intersect. So in your illustration, you actually have the particles collect, uh, uh, colliding rather than their paths. So that's presumably quite unlikely by comparison. Yeah, so the, so the particles actually, right, that's right. So it's, it's a different question when you talk about the particles themselves or their paths. Here I want to look at their paths. And it turns out that if you have three random walks, then the probability that they go for n steps without intersecting is approximately n to the minus 35 over 24. And more generally, if you have k random walks, where k is greater than or equal to 2, the probability that they go for n steps without intersecting is about n to the minus zeta k, where this number zeta k depends on k in this way here. So it's just 1 over 24 times 4k squared minus 1. Does it matter where they start? Uh, it doesn't matter where they, where they start. So where they start is just going to affect the constant, which here I folded into this little O1 in the exponent. And right, so this turned out to be uh, a very hard problem, but it's also an important question. And at least for probabilists, it's important. And the reason that it's important is that these numbers are very closely related to the fractal properties of two-dimensional Brownian motion. Uh, one particular example is that the Hausdorff dimension of the cut points of Brownian motion turns out to be given by 2 minus uh, zeta 2. And the fact that this... What's the cut point? Uh, so, so what does it mean for a point to be uh, a cut point of Brownian motion? So let's say this point here is going to be a cut point for my, my Brownian motion. If it's true that the Brownian motion comes in, it visits this point, and then it goes away. And this point has the property that if I erase it, if I were to remove this from the range of the Brownian motion, then it would actually disconnect this into two pieces. Okay. And you can see why zeta 2 is related to uh, cut points for Brownian motion. It's because after visiting this point, when the Brownian motion goes away, it's like one Brownian motion, one random walk. And the time reversal of the Brownian motion up until when it hits this point is also like an independent Brownian motion. And so we just we want to know how unlikely is it that these two Brownian motions go away without uh, intersecting each other. Yeah, and so this, um, this formula for the Hausdorff dimension of the cut points of two-dimensional Brownian motion, this was derived uh, some time ago by Greg Lawler, but he didn't give the exact number. He just gave the formula in terms of zeta 2. And upon verifying that zeta 2 is given by um, what you get when you plug 2 into here, it turns out that the Hausdorff dimension of these cut points is exactly um, the Now, why is this a hard problem? Well, the reason is that this is really just a counting question. So what you're trying to do is count the number of non-intersecting paths that go for a certain number of steps. And that, when you work on the planar grid, is a complicated combinatorial, uh, complicated combinatorial question. 
So how is this question solved? Well, the general philosophy here is that it's often easier to solve questions like this one when you don't work on Z2, but rather when you work on a random graph, in particular one of these uh, random quadrangulations. And so how did this go? Well, so this um, physicist, Bertrand de Plantier, what he did is he formulated this question, the same one, except on a random quadrangulation. And he solved uh, the problem there and calculated what the corresponding exponents are. And then after doing that... Well, the thing you had before was a particular quad quadrangulation. That was a particular quadrangulation. The outside thing was a square. That's right. So that was a quadrangulation, but you could also try to do it on a random, a random quadrangulation. And, and then what he did is he applied uh, a heuristic from physics, which is called the KPZ relation. And what the KPZ relation uh, does for you is it tells you how to convert probabilities that you've computed on random quadrangulations into probabilities for the corresponding problem, but on the Euclidean lattice. Okay, but this isn't just a heuristic, it's not math. And so where does the math come in? Well, later this prediction was verified um, mathematically by Lawler, Schramm, and Turner using something called the schramm lawler equation. And if you've heard of SOD, then you know that this was actually one of the really big early successes in SOD. This was done almost uh, almost immediately after it came out. It's just a couple of years. Okay, and then there are other similar examples where um, this was the general general framework in which one worked. Okay, and so what those initials stand for? KPZ. Oh, it's Kishnik, Polyakov, Zaminolchikov. Okay, and one actually kind of funny thing is that in probability there are actually two KPZs. This is one of the KPZs, not the other KPZs. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that other KPZ doesn't make a problem. Carter Freeze exam is the other KPZ. This is Kishnik, uh -huh. Polyakov, Zaminolchikov. So there are actually two KPZs in probability. Now, what I want to tell you about today is the kinds of things that you would have to do if you wanted to turn this step here into rigorous mathematics. Okay? So you want some way to solve problems of this type where you do not have to have a separate argument at the end to verify the physics type derivation mathematically. And if you think about it, what you need to do in order to you know, make mathematical sense of this is you need to figure out a way to compare your random quadrangulations with something like Z2. And so that's what, um, what we're going to look at in just a little bit. So, so this is the goal to compare an average sure. random triangulation and quadru an, an average random quadrangulation to Z2? Or yeah, so, so, you, so you sort of somehow pick a typical quadrangulation. You want to put them onto a common space and try to understand how these things differ from you. You'll see this more in But just, does that literally mean that you sort of Imagine solving the problem for every quadrangulation, and then you take away the average of those, or do you say no? So you solve something like a quenched version. Okay, so in this stuff, there's there's often um, there's sort of like quenched versus zero, and so when you solve sort of the quenched version of the problem, what it means is that uh, it sort of says like if you sample a high quadrangulation, then with high probability, um, then with high probability, uh, the behavior is this, like the exponent is this behavior. And then the annealed version of the problem is where you would average over, uh, over all quadrangulations. And in this particular problem, it's not going to make a difference whether it's a bunch of versus a new. The way that these exponents transform, it's actually easier to prove the annealed version of it. And in sort of the mathematical theory that I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about um, in a moment, actually the annealed, annealed sort of version of the problem was solved first, and then later people worked out a bunch of versions. Oh, but I mean, it, it's sort of just very stupid day-to-day, -day, on a stupid day-to-day -day level, it's like, like the difference between a, a median and an average, right? And you're saying that you're, you're actually, you're, you're sort of seeing what's the median behavior rather than the average behavior. Is that correct? Um, when you say that, you, when, when you're, you're not averaging over a large a sample of, 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 of different quadrants, you're sort of saying you can choose a typical one and do it for a typical one, right? Yeah, so, so what happens often with in these things is that if you pick a typical quadrangulation, it's going to have a certain behavior. So like in this particular case, you pick a typical quadrangulation, and then you get an exponent. And you know, as long as it's true that this sort of typical behavior, which gives you the exponent, is sort of concentrated enough, 
then there won't be a distinction between whether or not you average over all other emulations or you ask um, what happens for a typical model. I mean, the kind of statement that you know, what you want to say is that if you sort of integrate over all quadrate relations, what is the probability that you have a given property? And for these kinds of exponents, it's something like 1 minus lumbo of 1. So if you pick a typical quadrate relation, it's going to have the property that you want. Whether or not you integrate over all of them at the end isn't going to make a difference. But usually, it's easier to prove things in the setting where you do integrate over everything. Okay. Now, when you talk about uh, random quadrangulations, there are a number of different natural uh, laws that you can put under quadrangulations. So, you know, what is the measure that you use to choose them at random? The simplest, but also very interesting and very natural choice, is you just put the uniform measure on quadrangulations. And you know, all that this means is that you have a bag that has all of your quadrangulations of a given size, and you just pick one out. And you see, you know, what does it look like? Now, this is not the only natural choice. There are many other natural choices in quadrangulations. Another nat natural choice is that you take your quadrangulations, and then the probability that you pick it is going to be proportional to the number of spanning trees that this particular graph uh, emits. Okay. So rather than choosing a quadrangulation uniformly at random, the probability that you're going to pick it is proportional to the number of spanning trees that you have on the and the reason that this is a really nice... Um, that means it's a tree that goes to every vertex. Right, that's right. And the reason uh, that this is a very natural law to consider is that when you pick a quadrangulation, the probability proportional to the number of uh, spanning trees that it admits, it's equivalent to thinking of picking a pair, m comma t, where m is going to be your quadrangulation, and t is going to be um, a spanning tree on the map. So if you enumerate all possible pairs, m comma t, put them into a bag, and pick one uniformly at random, then the uh, marginal law on the map is going to be the same thing as what you would have gotten if you had picked it proportional to the number of, uh, number of spanners. And there's this general idea, and this goes back to, uh, to Mullen, and that's that you could encode um, a map of this type so a random planar map together with uh, a spanning tree in terms of what are called the contour functions of the tree dual tree pair. So let me just uh, illustrate this for you uh, pictorially, and then I'm going to show you what this is. You did it right there, isn't that it? Uh, you? Right, this is, this is it's related to it. Let me, let me erase it and draw it one more time. Okay. Um, so here's my, my planar map. So this is down. And then on your map, you have uh, your spanning tree. So it looks something like this. And, um, right. and then this, uh, this spanning tree, you can encode in terms of its contour function. So again, the way that this works is you pick, say, a vertex on it, and you call it the root. And then you just trace the boundary of the spanning tree. And as you go, you keep track of um, your distance to the root. So you might get something that looks like this. OK, and this is what the, uh, the contour function for uh, the static tree looks like. And then you can draw in uh, the dual tree to this map. And I'll show you what this looks like in practice in just a minute. So maybe it looks something like this. This is, this is the dual tree. And then you can draw the contour function for the, um, the dual tree. And I'm going to draw it uh, upside down, and this will become uh, clear later. So it looks something like that. Okay. And the idea behind this, this bijection being Mullen is that these two um, contour functions uh, encode the structure of this, um, this planar map, together with this distinguished uh, spanning tree. And this, uh, this idea, this was generalized by Sheffield to encode maps that are not decorated by a spanning tree, 
but you can also decorate your map by a family of loops. Okay? And this particular projection, he likes to call the, uh, the hamburger cheeseburger um, projection. And I don't want to focus on this, but the natural loop model, which works very well with this in the random setting, is something called the FK model, uh, if you happen to know what that is. But I won't focus on, on, on the, the definition. OK, so this is a picture of what this looks like. So this is a, a random quadrangulation that I actually sampled myself using the hamburger cheeseburger digestion. And I'll explain in a moment how I embedded this particular graph uh, into the plan. OK, and now what I have done is I have drawn on top of this map uh, a spanning tree. And in what graph does this tree span? Well, since this is a quadrangulation, it's a bipartite graph. And so, every one of these quadrilaterals, um, I, uh, I can, I, sorry, I can group the two uh, classes for this map, um, and every quadrilateral will have uh, across its diagonal two blue, two blue vertices, and then across its other diagonal it will have a pair of red vertices. Now, if you look at this, it might look like this is not quite right because on the boundary, you know, you don't see an opposing blue vertex, vertex for this particular. Um, this particular shape here. And the reason is that here I'm sampling a quadrilateral with boundary, and so this is really just half of a half of a quadrilateral, it's just a triangle. And this uh, tree here, this red tree, this is a spanning tree in the graph which consists of the red vertices in the quadrilateral. And the edges in this graph just consist of diagonals which connect uh, opposing red vertices. So this is a distinguished spanning tree. And it might not look quite like a spanning tree, because it not, might not look like a tree to you, because it actually contains this cycle which goes around the boundary. But the way that I want to think of this is that the boundary of the graph just consists of a single vertex. This is sort of like the root of the spanning tree. <coughs> now here, there are some quadrilaterals, like this one, where I have not drawn a, uh, a red diagonal. And what I'm going to do with each one of these guys is I'm going to draw in the opposite blue diagram. And then I get my, uh, my dual tree. Okay. So this is what a quadrangulation looks like together with its tree dual tree pair. And the way that I want to think of this quadrangulation is it's what you get when you take the tree dual tree pair and then you glue them along this, um, this space filling path. So this, this piano curve here, it just snakes in between the red tree and the blue tree, and it visits every single edge inside of this map. And this is again the idea behind the um, both the Mullen bijection, its generalization we just got, the hamburger cheeseburger bijection, is that somehow the entire structure of one of these tree decorated maps can be encoded in terms of the gluing of two trees along uh, a space filling map. Okay, so this is the structure we want to look at. Now what I want to do is tell you a little bit about how this graph was uh, embedded into the plane. So the way that I did it is that I took my quadrangulation and then I subdivided each one of the quadrilaterals into uh, 24 triangles. And the reason I did that is that now the graph that I have, this turns out to be a triangulation which does not have any multiple edges. And it turns out that whenever you have a triangulation without any multiple edges, you can always represent the graph using a circle packing. And what this means is that for each vertex in your graph, you have a circle, like this, this guy here. And then the way that the adjacency structure of this uh, graph is supported is that two vertices, like this one and this one, are adjacent if and only if the corresponding circles uh, intersect. And so this is what the circle packing uh, this triangulation looks like. Corey, to start to, this is what the Riemann mapping looks like. Right, so just one step ahead. <laughs> um, right, and, and how is this computed? So this was computed with a very nice piece of software due to Ken Stephenson called CirclePack, where you can load in uh, a graph like this and makes makes these kinds of pictures. Okay, and so what we really want to understand is what is the limit as the size of the quadrilateral goes to infinity of this particular embedding. And the reason is that um, you know, circle packings are very closely related to conformal maps. And the types of statistical physics models that we see, like for example the random walks that I talked about earlier, play very well with conformal maps. 
So this is sort of the right, uh, right type of embedding to, um, to consider. All right. And the colors that you see here, these just tell you the order in which these uh, circles are visited by the space the path that I showed you earlier. And as I tried to explain, this is the type of embedding that one wants to consider if you want to compare the structure of a random quadrangulation with, uh, with Z2. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about some of the convergence results that have been proved for random planar maps. Um, so first of all, if you consider a uniformly random map, then um, it was shown by Chasing and Schaefer about 10 years ago that if you have n faces, then the typical diameter of the map turns out to be n to the 1 quarter. Um, then it was later shown by Jean-Paul Le Bell. Does the notation indicate that it's that times a constant, or what sense is it n to the 1 quarter? Ah, so what that means is it's that, it's that times a random constant, and as n goes to infinity, this random constant is not going to blow up. So it's always, so like the probability, a half is between minus 10 and 10, and the probability, um, you know, 0.99999 is between minus a million and a million. So somehow not blowing up when it goes to. But so you have upper and lower bounds by multiples of n to the quarter? Is that the, right. Is that the form of the statement? Yeah, so another way of saying is that if you were to, uh, to divide distances by n to the one quarter, and then you take a limit as n goes to infinity, then um, then you would get some kind of limit or subsequential limit, some kind of compactness. And, um, and this is really what you know, kind of the idea that uh, needs to be made a bit more precise by Jean-François Legault. And what he showed is that if you, if you rescale distances by the factor n to the minus one quarter, then you can actually take a subsequential limit of these random planar maps. And the topology here is the gromov helfstrom topology. So you want to think of your random planar map as corresponding to a metric space. And what this is saying is that if you divide distances by the factor n to the minus one quarter, then you can take a subsequential limit of your random metric spaces, and you get something which is non-trivial. And so this was, I think, in about 2007. And you know, people, what people really wanted to do is they wanted to get rid of this word here, subsequential, and show that you really do have uh, a true limit. Now, before that happened, there was uh, some interesting things which, um, which was established. So first of all, it was shown that this was first done by uh, the Gall and Cohen, is that every subsequentially limiting uh, space that you get is uh, homeomorphic to the sphere. So, so subsequential limits are homeomorphic to the sphere. To be analogous theorems for higher genus surfaces, if you put maps on like a torus or right, it would be analogous. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But that's all now been studied. Uh, um, so what this is saying is that somehow in your random quadrangulation, when n gets large, you don't pinch off any bubbles. And it was also shown uh, by the doll that the subsequential limits always have house surf dimension four. So the type of space that you get is topologically a sphere, and its half of dimension is equal to 4. And this is not so surprising, because this is the scaling factor that you use um, to get something more trivial. And then finally, uh, all of this work culminated with two works. They are independent, the so one by Legal and the other by, um, by River and Miermont. And what they showed is that you don't have to pass along subsequences. You really do get a limit. And this is uh, now what's called uh, the Brownian map. This means for all, almost all, you have to put almost all on there somewhere, right? Well, so this is, a, this is really a statement about a family of measures, because for each n, you have a probability measure, and then you want to say that these measures converge to a limiting measure with respect to a certain, certain topology. So there isn't, there isn't a natural coupling between quadrangulations of given size. So natural notion of convergence is distribution of convergence. OK, so this and is so, what, But this is, this is convergence in a, in a different sense than the previous? Before you were taking the Gromov Hausdorff limit of, of spaces, and you're not. Right. These are the values of the functions that are converted. So these are random variables which take values in the space of compact metric spaces with the Gromov Hausdorff topology. 
And then you want to set these random variables converge in distribution to a limiting object. And that's what the that's what they're really get. This is this still with values in the space of the metric space. That's right. So it's a metric space, metric space value there. Right. Okay, so this is what happens for uh, for uniformly random quadrangulations. When you consider uh, quadrangulations where you weight by the number of spanning trees, the story is, is pretty different. So here, uh, as I tried to explain before, you have this hamburger cheeseburger bijection. And the idea is that this gives you a way to encode your, uh, your map in terms of a gluing of a pair of trees along uh, a space of these um, So this is this, this picture here. You have your map, you have your pair of trees, and somehow the structure is represented by the gluing of these, these trees. And what's shown by, um, by Sheffield is that the contour functions for these two trees, so these are these two, uh, these two functions that I've graphed here, these things converge in the limit, and they converge to a pair of, um, a pair of uh, grounding motions. And the difference here is that the notion of convergence that, that's shown does not really encode uh, the metric structure of the map. It's encoding a different kind of information. So you don't really get a handle on distances. You get a handle on other things. And um, yeah, and so for when the, the random finger maps are just weighted by the number of spanning trees, it turns out that the Brownian motions that you get are going to be independent Brownian motions. And for these general uh, FK random maps, that they don't want to talk about the Brownian motions are correlated in uh, a certain way. Now, one very interesting question, and this is actually a big, also controversial question in this particular area, is that if you have a tree-weighted random planar map, what is its diameter? So we know that for uniformly random planar maps, the typical diameter is n to the one quarter. And for tree-weighted random planar maps, the typical diameter should be something like n to the alpha. But the question is, what is the value of alpha? What is the parameter? Q? Oh, so Q, so there, there's this, also this family of, of loop, uh, of loop. random finger match with loops, and somehow the Q is related to the loops, but I didn't want to say too much about, uh, about that. So, so yeah, so there's this question is, what is the typical diameter of a tree-weighted random planar map? And this is something which is actually uh, very controversial in this area, because nobody knows what the right answer is supposed to be. So there is this uh, physics prediction from about 20 years ago, from 1993, uh, due to a lot of And what he says is that he predicts that the diameter is going, is going to be of order n to the alpha, where alpha is given by 1 quarter times the square root of 17 minus 3, which turns out to be about 0 point, uh, bigger. 281. Bigger than the other one. That's right, so it'll have a bigger diameter. And, uh, but nobody knows whether or not this is actually correct. And there's a lot of controversy in this, because people have done simulations to try to get a handle on what the exponent is. But it's very hard uh, from these simulations to check whether or not this is correct. And the reason is that you're trying to get a handle on the power, you know, this exponent here, and you need to do really, really large simulations in order to, to do this accurately. Not just experimental prediction, or is there some? No, no, there's some, there's some, uh, there's some basis for this particular prediction. But people have done experiments. I've actually done my own experiments, and. You know, what I get is something like 0 0.27, maybe 0 0.29, so something which is pretty close. And so this is actually within the margin of error, but it seems like it's hard to do a simulation when you get something that says that this is really uh, decisive. So and it is bigger. Your experiment shows it's bigger. I've, I've kind of gotten both directions. Uh, so I have oh, no, no, bigger than 0.25. Oh, right, yeah, so everyone believes it's bigger than 0.25, but we don't know how much. And lots of other people have done simulations too, but other people have gotten things like 0 0.25. They've gotten just the same number. And, uh, and so the you know, simulations are sort of all over the place, and nobody knows uh, how to nail this down. I mean, if you were to, to actually wait by, by into the minus alpha here, then most of what you saw in the previous picture would just go away, which would collapse to zero, right? Because you're, you're scaling it down. Ah, so, so, so somehow the, the typical behavior you concentrated in, on in this picture is just completely different. Uh, no, so, so the end of the alpha here refers to the graph distance. All right, so you're trying to scale it down so that you're going to keep it bounded by dividing the... You say go ahead and scale by whatever it takes to keep it bounded. And, see, and, then, and then what? And then presumably you could see some very different behavior because most of what you were seeing in the previous 
way when the but stuff that collapses. Is there different, there are different measurements. It's so uniformly random versus extreme weighted. So, so the difference is that the, the other pictures that I was showing shows the maps embedded in a particular way. And so there really is kind of an implicit scaling factor somehow. Uh, so here, this is the sort of scaling factor that you would need if you wanted to pick uh, a metric space, a metric space of, of your, your finger maps. I think it might be a different, slightly different question. Okay, so this is, again, this is the source of big controversy. It's the same thing is true for these generalizations of, of three way layer maps. Nobody knows what the right uh, answer is. So the geometry is ahead, way ahead in the other, in the uniform. That's right, the geometry is way ahead. You have a geometry, you don't know care about it. Here you don't even know right. how big what the diameter is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So here, there's a lot, um, <coughs> there are a lot of questions that just don't seem uh, accessible yet. And this is one particular one. Which has uh, gotten a lot of attention. Okay, so this was the kind of uh, whirlwind tour of uh, what random finger maps are. Now, what I want to do is show you a construction that you can build by gluing together a pair of what are called continuum random trees. And I'm going to try to explain how this construction is related to the scaling limit problem for random finger maps. Okay, so just to remind you, what is the perspective that we want to take? It's that we can view one of these random quadrangular relations as somehow being a, a gluing of trees along a space fitting path. And as I've tried to explain, there's this result into Sheffield which tells you that the contour functions for these trees, so these guys over here that I graphed, these things converge when you take a limit as n goes to infinity. So if you were to. So here, so how all this works. So you have your map with your, your pair of trees. You encode it using a bijection in terms of these contour functions. And now if you send the size of the map to infinity, then um, what he shows is that these two uh, contour functions, these things converge, and what they converge to are a pair of uh, a pair of random motions. So this is what you get in the limit. And what it seems like is that once you apply this uh, bijection and then take a limit as the size of the map goes to infinity, somehow you're losing all of the geometric information about the map. Okay. So what I want to do now is explain how to reconstruct the geometry of the limit from the pair of limiting gravity motions. Okay, so here's how it works. So what I want you to imagine is that you have a pair of independent gravity motions. And what I've done for you in this slide is I have graphed one of the Brownian motions. This is x sub t down here. And then on the top, I've graphed c minus the other Brownian motion. And this constant here that I've chosen, c, this is a random constant so that these two graphs would actually be disjoint from each other. Okay. And so this picture here is representing exactly the limit that you get when n goes to infinity of the, uh, of the random frame. And now what can you do? Well, in the continuum, you can take this uh, graph of x of t here, and you can glue it together. And the way that you do it is you identify points on this graph if they can be connected by a horizontal line which lies below the curve. Okay, so you just draw in all of these green lines here, and you glue things together if they can be connected by one of these horizontal lines. And if you do this, then the object that you get is going to be a tree, a continuum tree, and this is what's actually known as the, the continuum random tree in probability. It's invented by, by David Alvis about 20 years ago. Okay. And why is, it, why is this natural sense to do this identification? This group, why is this natural subsumption to do this? Uh, so it has to do with the fact that you can always encode trees in terms of contour functions. So the way that you get a, a contour function from a tree is that you just you go around just this is just the reverse operation. So trees can always be encoded, encoded like this. Okay, so you get your continuum random tree. And you can do the same thing for the top graph, except for now you draw horizontal lines which lie above it, and what you get is another continuum random tree. So now I have a pair of trees in the continuum, exactly like I have in the discrete set. And now what I can do is I can take my two trees, and I can glue them together, and the way that I glue these trees together is that I draw now in red vertical lines between these two graphs. And I say that points are going to be equivalent 
if they're on a common red line. Who invented this? Sorry? You? Who invented this? These green and red lines. Oh, who invented this particular construction? Yeah. Well, this is, um, I mean, this is just the um, this is just the continuing analog of this this well, here. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. You get a two sphere. Right. And so, so the question, and also one step ahead, is you can ask what type of structure do you get when you glue together a pair of continuum random trees? And the answer is that you're going to get a topological sphere together with a space filling path. So just like in the street side, my random planar map was a gluing of trees along a space filling path. Well, the limiting structure that you get is these pair of browning motions. These are also going to describe a topological sphere together with a space filling path. And we have a name for this, and this is what we call the piano sphere. So it's a piano sphere because it's a sphere, and piano because, well, the space filling path is the piano curve for the pair of trees. There's a preferred point, too, or something, right? Yeah, this so... presentation. Right, so it looks like, right, there's, this is sort of the root, the mm -hmm. root of point. The right? preferred point, I mean, the bottom point there. The bottom green line is point. That's right, and so that will come up in the next slide. So, yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're reading my mind, so... Does it have to be a point? Maybe. Oh, because if, if it comes back down, you're done. Right, so I want this to be a sphere, and so this, is, this will be important for just a moment. So what I want to do now is explain why you get a sphere when you perform this particular ruling operation. And the reason, well, one way to check this is that you can use this theorem due to Moore from 1925. And what this tells you is that if you have any topologically closed equivalence relation to the sphere, and you know that each equivalence class is connected and not equal to the entire sphere, then what you get when you mod out by this equivalence relation is going to be homeomorphic to the sphere if and only if it has the property that no equivalence class separates the sphere into two or more points. So this makes sense because this is basically saying that if you start off with the sphere and you start to glue it together, then you're going to get a sphere as long as you don't do something like pitch on the ball. It's kind of a natural question. And what does it mean for the equivalence relation to be topologically closed? It just means that if you have any two sequences, x and y, in, and they're equivalent for any n, and they both have limits, then the limits are also uh, equivalent. So it just says that this is somehow uh, a continuous equivalence uh, relation. And so what we're going to do now is just check that Morse theorem holds when you glue together a pair of these trees. OK. So again, I have my two browning motions. And I'm using these red and green lines to get an equivalence relation on this, uh, on this sphere. So first of all, why is this even an equivalence relation on the sphere? Well, first of all, this defines an equivalence relation on this rectangle, because I've told you how to glue the rectangle together. And it gives you an equivalence relation on the sphere because the outer boundary of the rectangle is always glued to just one point. So this is just a sphere. And the way that we check uh, that more theorem hold is that you can just, first of all, look and see what types of equivalence classes can you possibly have. And it turns out that there are only four. So first of all, the outer boundary of the rectangle, that's one type of equivalence class that I've already mentioned. The next possibility is that you can have a vertical line which does not share an endpoint with a horizontal line. Um, so for example, you know, maybe this vertical line here would be of, of this type. And actually, this is the most common type of equivalence class that we're going to have, at least among the, the, the red lines. And the reason is that Brownian motion does not like to have uh, local minimum. So it doesn't have local minimum very often. And that's kind of what you need in order to have a different type of equivalence class. OK, the next possibility is that you can have a horizontal line which uh, lies either below the graph of x or above the graph of c minus y together with the two vertical lines that t off of it. And then you get a picture that looks like this. That's what one of these equivalent classes looks like. Either this or that. That's the third type. And then the last type of equivalence class that you can have is you can have a horizontal line, which is either below x or above c minus y, together with the two vertical lines, which hit it at its endpoints, and then this horizontal line can actually meet the graph of x or the graph of c minus y in the middle. So for example, this line right here, it has, this equivalence class has this horizontal line. It has the red line which goes there, 
and it has the red line which goes down that way. Oh, sorry. The red line which goes down here. We have the red line which goes down over here. And then it also hits the, um, it hits the, the graph of C minus Y right in the middle, so you also get the red line right down the middle. And so this type of equivalence class looks like this. And, um, and these are the only possibilities. So this is something which is not difficult to check uh, the basic properties of random motion. These are the only possibilities. And once you know this, uh, it's also not difficult to see that this equivalence relation is topologically closed and does not separate the sphere into two or more connected components. And therefore, what you get when you mod out by this is actually going to be very different to the sphere. Okay. Where does the space filling path come from? Well, it just comes from what you get when you follow the red lines from left to right, and then you project down. You mod out by the equivalence relation. And this will be a space filling path because when you bought uh, out by this equivalence relation, all that's left are the graph of x and the graph of c minus 1. Those give you all of the points in the quotient space. And since every point on the graphs of these two functions is visited by some vertical line, this path actually will um, will this space. Okay. And again, we call this pair, this uh, sphere space filling path pair, the uh, piano sphere. And the question that we want to understand is what is the right way to put the piano sphere back into the Euclidean space? And the reason is that, again, using this, um, this correspondence between random planar maps and gluings of trees, and the fact that in the limit, the structure that you get is exactly the piano sphere, answering this question um, you know, will tell you something about the right embeddings of the limits of random planar maps into the, into the sphere. So you described this construction of the two spheres, a topological space, but you haven't given it any geometry. But right. So the previous assertions were that you actually had some kind of geometric structure on the two right. spheres. So now what I'm going to do is talk about the right geometric structure to associate with this. And, and I'm going to explain how this is related to, well, in some sense, it solves one of the scaling limit problems for random random maps. That's what's coming. OK. OK, so now, uh, before I get there, uh, what I have to do is describe uh, what's going to provide sort of the right geometry to embed these, uh, these, these trees. So this is what's called uh, Lievo quantum gravity. So Lievo quantum gravity is going to be a continuum theory of random surfaces. And the starting point for it is the uniformization. So just to remind you, what this says is that if you have any simply connected uh, ring surface, then you can always conformally map it to either the disk, the plane, or the sphere, uh, depending on which one is topologically uh, equivalent to. And the nice property that this has is that if you take now the metric for your surface and you parameterize it using this conformal map, then it's always going to take the form uh, e to the rho of z times um, the base metric for the space that you're using to parameterize it. And this uh, actor row is called the, the, the component path. And what this means is that you can parameterize the space of surfaces of this type uh, using the space of, of smooth functions. And for example, you know, if you take your, you know, your function row to be equal to zero here, you're just going to recover whatever space that you use to um, parameterize your surfaces. And if you take your function to have zero Laplacian so that it's harmonic, then what you're describing is the flat surface. And so if you want to use this as the starting point to develop a theory of random surfaces, the question that you have to answer is what is the right measure to put on your function's row? And somehow, the way that uh, we want to think of these surfaces is that they're somehow going to be the natural perturbation of a flat, a flat surface. And so in order to do this, the type of row that you have to choose is somehow going to be the, the canonical perturbation of, of a harmonic function. And what is the canonical perturbation of a harmonic function? This is something called um, the Gaussian free field. And the way that I usually introduce the Gaussian free field is by first talking about the discrete Gaussian free field, because this is much easier to uh, much easier to define. And what it is is it's just the measure of functions which are defined on a subset of the two-dimensional integer lattice. They have some prescribed boundary condition, 
And they have this density here with respect to uh, the wave measure. So here what I'm doing in exponential is that I'm summing over all um, edges of my graph and taking the square of the gradient of my function uh, across that edge. And the reason that this is the natural perturbation of a harmonic function, in some sense, is that the minimizer of this energy functional that you see here is exactly the discrete harmonic extension of your boundary values. Because this is just the discrete Dirichlet energy. And these are pictures on the right hand side of what discrete Dirichlet features look like uh, on different size levels. So this is 20 by 20, and this is 100 by 100. And the object that we're actually interested in is called the continuum Gaussian free field. It's just what you get when you take the discrete Gaussian free field and you take a scaling and it converges to something. The reason that I introduced the continuum Gaussian free field as a scaling in this way is that it's a little bit difficult to describe exactly what it is because it's not a random function. Rather, it's a random variable which takes value in the space of distribution. It doesn't have values in points. So this is what the Gaussian free field is. And if you haven't seen this before, it's something which is really important in probability because it comes up in many different places. Just like Brownian motion describes the scaling limits of random curves, the Gaussian free field turns out to describe the scaling limits of many different types of random surfaces. <coughs> okay, and finally, what is Lievo quantum gravity? Lievo quantum gravity is the random object that you get when you take the Euclidean metric and you perturb it by the factor e to the gamma h, where h is a Gaussian free field. And this gamma here is a parameter. And this model was introduced by a physicist named Polyakov in the 1980s. And what he wanted to do was to generalize the notion of a path integral to the setting of, of surface. Now, you have to be very careful when you look at this expression here because it doesn't really make sense. Because this is supposed to be e to the gamma of h, but h is a distribution, not, not a function. And so it takes a little bit of work to, to make mathematical sense of real function gravity. And one way to do it is that you take your, your, your h here, you regularize it in some way, and then you show that you can take a limit as the uh, size of the multiplication goes to zero. And so far, the way that people can think about this is that what you get is something which is a, a random area measure. And so the operations that you can perform are that you can calculate areas of regions and lengths of curves. That's kind of what you're able to do. But a priori, you do not have a notion of distance. So you can't calculate the distance between points. OK, over here on the right-hand side, these are just some pictures to show you what Lebo quantum gravity looks like. So what I've done is I've taken- Do Brownian pass their finite length? Do Brownian pass- In this story? They're, they're boundary lengths. The boundary of the Brownian pass. When gamma is equal to the square root of eight bits, or special value of gamma. But you do have a conformal structure? Yeah, so you, you know you know kind of what Brownian motion is. There's a way of making sense of Brownian motion, but you don't have a distance. That's the, that's the metric. Okay, and what these pictures show you are what um, equally sized patches of surface look like inside of this metric. And you know, so you have some regions which are pretty big in the Euclidean sense, but these are very very small in the uh, in with respect to this this notion. On the other hand, you have these really, really tiny things in the Euclidean sense, which, um, well, they have the same size as these patches over here. And when you increase the value of gamma, this effect becomes more and more um, extreme. And here it is at the critical parameter, gamma equals 2. OK, so finally, um, now that we tell you what the, the conjectures are, the conjecture is that when gamma is equal to the square root of 8 thirds, Lievo quantum gravity is the same as the Brownian map, the metric space scaling limit of random perpendiculation. And if you think about this, it's kind of a weird statement to make because you have to think about what it really means because we're talking about two different types of objects. So on the one hand, the Brownian map is an abstract metric space, whereas square root 8 thirds Lievo quantum gravity is a, um, a random measure on, say, a subset of the and there are kind of three different ways, which are kind of natural to think about making this precise. So one possibility is that you have a natural area measure over here, just because you can assign each vertex in your graph to say have mass one. And what you can try to show is that if you embed this graph, say conformally with a circle packing, etc., then the induced area measure you get on the right hand side actually converges to um Lievo quantum gravity. That's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is you could try to show that they're the same in what we call the mating of trees sense. And here, what you want to do is you want to put a space-filling path 
on top of Louisville quantum gravity, it showed that this uh, path is in some sense the, the gluing of a pair of grounding motions, which as I described a moment ago, described the scaling limit of, of random numbers. And then the last possibility is that you could try to look at the same as metric spaces, and the way that you would do this is that you have to figure out a way to put a metric on Leo quantum gravity and show that the resulting metric is isometric to um, the grounding map. Okay. And today's talk is supposed to be about uh, our solution to this particular problem, the mating of tree sets, and our solution to the metric space version of this, something which um, is based on an object that we call QLE. This is uh, another topic that I won't. Okay, so now since I've run um, a bit over time, let me just show you what this theorem statement is sort of saying in pictures. So again, we have our random quadrangulation, and you can represent it as a gluing of trees along a space filling path. And what you want to do in the continuum is you want to find a space filling path that you can put on top of your Leonardo quantum gravity surface and show that it is, in a certain sense, a gluing of your um, and this is a picture of what that path looks like. Uh, let me show you the animation. Now. So this is the um, this is the piano curve, which is associated with a pair of continuum trees that you can put on top of Leibel quantum gravity, and well, they turn out to be exactly the in a certain sense the gluing of these two trees here. And if you've heard of SLE before, this is a variant of SLE. And it's just like regular SLE, the only difference is that whenever it, whenever it cuts off a region, whenever, you know, sometimes it, it hits the boundary, let's say, rather than continuing out to infinity, what it does is it branches in and then fills in the component it cut out and then it branches out. So it's just sort of a space filling version of SLE. And it turns out that this is the, this is the right way to embed um, this uh, gluing of continual magnet trees into uh, into the quantum gravity. Okay. You can never take yourself into the corner. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, okay, and then let me just quickly state what the main theorem is. So I apologize for going on. So the main theorem just says exactly what I just said. So there's a certain type of Leibniz quantum gravity surface. We call this a, a quantum cone. And the theorem says is that in a certain sense, there's a unique way to construct the surface by taking a pair of trees, which are described by grounding motions, and gluing them together. And when you glue them together, the interface between them is a is a form of the Schramm-Boltzmann um, SLE. Okay, and let me just make very quickly a few points. So this result tells you that within, with respect to a certain topology, if you take a random planar map, which is either decorated with a tree or a loop model, then when the size of the map goes to infinity, it actually does converge to Leo quantum gravity, decorated with a continuum loop model called CLE, where the topology of convergence here says that two surfaces are close if the contour function of their tree dual tree pair are close. So you get this convergence with respect to kind of a, a special topology. And if you know about SLE, then you know that for planar lattices, there have only been a few convergence results proved so far. So for example, uh, Lawler, Trump, and Werner show that the uniform spanning tree converges to um, SLE 8. It was shown by Smirnoff that percolation uh, converges to SLE 6. And then by Smirnoff again that the FK easing model which is one of these FK models converges to the S7 and 16. Where in contrast, this result that we have here tells you that if you look at the same types of models, so uh, uniform spanning trees or FK models, then they all converge to the right kind of S7, but it's with respect to this very special uh, topology. Okay. But just to emphasize, somehow in the continuum setting, the entire structure is determined by this uh, pair which consists of these, these two trees. Okay. And, yeah, and so this is uh, kind of
kind of a long paper, but let me just tell you very quickly a little bit more about what's in it. So in order to prove this kind of result, basically what you have to do is you have to develop a calculus of kind of random surfaces, and you have to sort of make sense of what it means to kind of glue these types of surfaces together and cut them into pieces. And, um, and so most of the paper is focused on making sense of, of these types of um, operations. And, um, you know, of course, this is not quite the topology that you want to prove convergences. But really what you want to do is you want to conformally embed your surface and make sure that that converges to the real point of gravity. Um, but we don't know how to do that uh, yet. And finally, uh, the types of techniques that we used um, in this work is also very much connected to what we use to solve the problem about the metric space structure of real point of gravity with uh, gamma sigma to the square root of this. And this is related to this thing called uh, Okay, so I apologize for going over, um, but that's it's good. It's awesome. So, but it is a question about conformal structures. So, does this fit here? Crush some natural conformal structure actually or not? So, yeah. So, once you have, um, I mean, there's a very natural way to define. Uh, so basically what we're doing is, you know, we're equipping it with a conformal structure by identifying it with Weaver quantum gravity. Because once you have Weaver quantum gravity, then you know, for example, what Brownian motion has to be. And once you know what Brownian motion is, then you have your notion of it. Let's just speak of the notion of lens and pair. Can you measure the modules of the equivalent address? Would it be a way to think of this? Uh, that might be, I guess, another way. Of, another way but I mean, the way that seems most natural to me, because I'm a probabilist, is to think about it in terms of defining Brownian motion. Once you know how to define Brownian motion, right? oh, on the surface, right on the surface. So that's like having a geometry, right? right. That little possible, right. right? So you know how to define Brownian motion. That's that's going to be a while back, you were talking about a space which where you could measure the lengths of curves but didn't have a metric, right? Does that mean the infimum of lengths of curves between points is always zero? Or? Yeah, so, so basically what you can do is you can calculate the length of a deterministic curve. So if you give me like a nice smooth curve, I can tell you how long it is. But then if, I, if you allow me to infamize over all possible curves, you're going to get, you're going to get zero. And so you have to add another scaling in if you want to get the correct notion of distance. And that's something no one needs, no one needs to do as far as I know. Okay,